grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ commanded the church with a, a great mission to go out into the world preaching the good news, uh, baptizing and teaching in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, and few, through my years, I have seen many different churches and viewed how they, they all had a unique approach to doing outreach and evangelism. For some churches, outreach only happens from the pulpit. The outreach of the church is the sermon that you hear on Sunday morning. No other work should be or needs to be done. Many churches, ours included, have boards of outreach and boards of evangelism, a group of people with a passion for mission who gather together and, and help to, to focus the church in different areas where they might be able to do that outreach. I think there's sometimes, though, where we get hung up on that word outreach. And in some ways, at least for me personally, I like it better if you flip-flop that compound word. Instead of being outreach, I think we're better suited to consider it reaching out. Especially when we move away from a congregation doing evangelism and mission to our own individual outreach, our own individual witness in the community. In our reading from Acts this morning, we get to see a beautiful glimpse of an individual reaching out to somebody else to share the gospel of Christ. Consider for a moment, if you will, the incredible string of events that happen to Philip as he witnesses to the Ethiopian eunuch. First, an angel of the Lord appears to Philip. This angel of the Lord tells Philip exactly where he needs to be. Then the angel of the Lord sends Philip to that exact place, that exact place where there's the Ethiopian eunuch who happens to be reading from the scriptures. And the Ethiopian eunuch is the one who engages with Philip. They engage with each other, and Philip understands what the eunuch is doing. Philip sees already that this person is reading from the scriptures. Now, I don't know about you, but it's not been all that often that an angel of the Lord has appeared to me and told me directly where to go to be at the right place in the right time. And it's, don't know about you either, but for me, it's not all that often that as I engage with somebody I might not know or an acquaintance, a family member, that as I engage them, they are already reading the scriptures. Philip doesn't have to turn the conversation to spiritual matters or the gospel, the eunuch asks Philip to help him understand what he is reading. The eunuch is the one who asks the direct questions that demand a response from Philip. The eunuch is the one who gives Philip the cue, that exact moment, Philip, I want you to tell me about Jesus right now. Finally, the eunuch and Philip just happen to pass by some water. Philip doesn't even need to suggest baptism. The eunuch does it for him. Look, there's water. What is it that's preventing me from being baptized? Philip, please baptize me so that I may be part of the vine, so that I may be connected to Christ. I don't know about you, but this seems rather easy. Scripture seems to present that reaching out to somebody else and engaging them in a topic about, about Jesus is super simple, almost as easy as falling off of a log. But for me, in my own personal life, my own personal outreach, my own personal reaching out, it very rarely happens that way. Maybe your experiences have been somewhat like mine. You look for opportunities, but they don't seem to come. Maybe you know there's that person that you want to engage with, but you never can seem to get the topic of conversation to be about Scripture. Maybe we've been working on someone for years and years and years, and they still do not believe. I don't know about you, but there's times where reaching out to other people becomes frustrating. Reaching out to other people means that I might end up feeling like a failure. Reaching out to other people becomes such a burden at times that maybe I end up trying to not reach out. 
I avoid engaging somebody else because I'm fearful of where that conversation is going to go. I'm fearful of not being able to say the right thing at the right time. I read this passage from Max, and I might even feel like a failure or get frustrated because it seems so easy for Philip, yet every time I do it, it's not easy as falling off a log. I'm tripping over the log and falling flat on my face. The story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, though, is really how things work out for evangelism. But maybe not so much from Philip's perspective, and maybe not so much from ours. The Holy Spirit leads Philip to be able to use the words that he already had heard from Christ, that he had already heard about Christ. The Spirit leads Philip by the power of the angel, to be with the Ethiopian eunuch. And here's where we see how God works. For just a moment, for a glimpse in Scripture, we get to see how the Holy Spirit works to create faith in somebody else. Most of the time, it's a, it's a mystery. God has put a, a cover over this mystery. We don't get to see how it happens. But God pulls the cover back here in Acts chapter 8 and says, Watch. Philip is able to share these words about Christ because the Spirit opened up his mouth. The Spirit gave him the words to speak. The Spirit that was sent forth by Christ. Christ who closed his mouth. As Philip was reading along with the eunuch from that passage from Isaiah, Philip reads where where Jesus was prophesied as being the one whose lips would remain silent. When he stood before Pontius Pilate, Jesus could have opened his mouth and defended his honor. Jesus could have opened his mouth and convinced Pilate to set him free, but he did not. By closing his mouth, Christ offered himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is hanging on the cross, his body battered and beaten, his spirit weakened, his flesh crying out in pain. He could have opened his mouth and commanded angels to come down and take him off that cross and minister him and heal him, but he did not. By closing his mouth, he purchased and won for you the victory over sin and death and hell. By closing his mouth, he has made you a new creation in him. And by being that new creation, because of Christ closing his mouth, he has now opened up your mouth. And by the power of the Spirit and Word, we now get to open up our mouths and speak those very words of forgiveness from Jesus himself. The very words of that gospel hope of a new creation a hope that our lives will not be spent in an eternity apart from God, but in fellowship with Him. The hope that Jesus is the vine and that He wants to graft us into Him so that we can have a constant source of life. He might even work by opening up your mouth to create faith through your witness. We've been given these words to speak, and all too often our brains say, no, I'm not going to have the right words, but but the words aren't ours to begin with. They come from Scripture. They are Jesus' words to speak, and he gives them to us for a purpose. We might not get sent by an angel to be at the specific place and time to meet an Ethiopian eunuch who's already reading Scripture and already has the questions on his lips to ask, But God has placed someone in your life. There is someone in your life who's waiting to hear those words come from your lips. Someone who maybe knows and acknowledges there's got to be a God. There's got to be something bigger than this world that I'm in. Someone who's waiting for someone else to come and tell them that there is a hope that the mess of this world isn't all that there is, that we have something to look forward to. There is someone in your life because God has put them there because you are part of the vine. God wants you to bear good fruit for him, and you do that when you're able to witness to somebody else. My prayer every day for myself, my prayer for us as a congregation, 
that the Spirit would lead us and give us strength and courage to open up our mouths and speak. Our words aren't always going to be eloquent and beautiful. Our words might sound foolish and awkward. Our words to us might sound like we're tripping and stumbling over this log, but really, in essence, our our job is as easy as falling off of the log. No matter how our words sound to us, when they are the words of God, the Holy Spirit works with those to create wisdom and grace. The Spirit works through the words that God has given us to break a hardened heart in that person that God has put in our lives. To break that hardened heart with the seed of the gospel that crushes through those rocks to create life. So that that person who was once bound to hell because of his or her unbelief now gets to experience life. They get to experience grace. Because it's us. It might not look pretty. It might appear clumsy, but in reality it is the good news of salvation. It might not look like the careful planning of the Spirit unfolding, but in reality it is. Because in reality, his words are the key that unlocks heaven to sinners. His words are the key that give us eternal life, that rescues us from the slavery of Satan's power. Just like you have been, so your words can be for somebody else. So as we leave this place this day, as we go traveling down that road and meet that person, that person that we've known our entire lives, the person we've worked with for years, lived next to for months, the person we've just met for the first time in our lives, have confidence. Be bold and courageous. Open your mouth to sow the word generously. Fling the seed of God's word here and there, even when in places where you might not expect the word to grow, because God's word is miraculous and powerful. May the Spirit grant success to that word and faithfulness to those who speak it. And may that word continue to grow in us unto life everlasting. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. And now the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our service continues with the prayers of the church. Please rise.